past you Floating into space All the things we've been through Are fading into blue I would drive to Neptune Just to love you more
Hey, what's up YouTube? Today we're gonna be going over my new favorite build. Not really. This is not really my favorite build. But this is a build that a lot of people have been requesting for. It is Spectral Helix Trinity Deadeye. A lot of people saw Jung play it on stream. And I took a look at it and it was pretty good. I originally had this character because I was actually doing the exact same type of concept, which is Trinity Deadeye Venom Gyre. But with the Hydra Spear nerf, it no longer works. But the two builds are almost near identical in the tree. But he did make it a lot more hardcore friendly with uh, cap spell suppression from the tree. And just a lot tankier in general. And Ghost Shrouds, which does help out a lot with the new Frenzy Charge change. So as you can see here, I did put it here to credit him. Uh, unfortunately, Jung is actually getting hit in the face with all the Spectral Helixes that the Deadeye is throwing out. Because the Deadeye is sick and tired of... Him making everyone play with her but let's get started with this build guy i want to make it a little bit shorter and sweeter and faster so let's go straight into the pros and cons of the build so let's go over the skill mechanics it's always nice to see what exactly spectral helix even is spectral helix is an attack skill it is not a melee skill you cannot use the fortify mastery on it spectral helix can bounce up to three times if it hits a wall and additional projectiles do not actually shoot out more spectral helix projectiles it just increases the number of times a projectile can bounce off a surface. Now, Spectral Helix comes with built-in Pierce, so it cannot fork and chain as Pierce happens first. Sniper's Mark, if you do decide to use it, it's a really bad idea. It stops a spiral, and it is bad. And one cast of Helix can hit multiple times with an internal cooldown of around 0.3 seconds. I couldn't really find any confirmation on this, but each attack of Helix can hit the boss multiple times, depending on how many times your Spectral Helix can spiral. As it spirals through 4.25 rotations, there's a helmet chain that gives you plus one spiral and how fat the boss is, right? So that's why the damage is so much higher on a fat boss because one cast of Helix can hit the boss within this internal cooldown time, maximum amount of times, right? Because it's so big. Now, Spectral Helix also has the added benefit of having 250% damage effectiveness. So flat elemental damage scaling is absolutely crazy, which is what we'll be scaling the build with. So for this Ascendancy, we are playing Deadeye, and Deadeye is really good because of early game shenanigans. You do get Tailwind from the very start, and this Tailwind can guarantee you up to 20% action speed. Now normally most Tailwind is 8%, but with the Gale Force stacks, it gives you, I think, 15% per Gale Force or something like that, so it's 150% effect. Now Ascendancy 2, you want to take is Far Shot. This Tailwind will make you really fast through the campaign. And then far shot will give you a lot of damage. So far, the way far shot works is projectile attack deals up to 60% more damage as the projectile travels further. Now this is not exactly about the distance the mob is away. It's so if the spectral helix is spiraling in a rotation like this, it has traveled up to the maximum distance after not too long. So a lot of times you will be hitting the mob with 60% more damage. So far shot is a pretty much a damage multiplier. It makes Deadeye a very competitive ascendancy in terms of pure raw damage. And then Deadeye also has Focal Point, which gives you 75% increased effect of marks, 25% less damage taken from other enemies near marked enemy, and marks are not removed from dying enemies. So what this means is that with Assassin's Mark, you can pretty much reach 100% crit really easily. And now with the new changes to Deadeye, the marks are not removed from dying enemies, so that means that you will be taking a lot less damage because if there's a mark on a dead corpse, that means all the mobs around will do 25% less damage. That is pretty useful for any boss fights with any adds or corpses, and it's actually pretty big. So next we have Ascendancy for Windward. Windward is 3% less damage taken per Gale Force, and then you lose all Gale Force when hit. Now this is pretty interesting and in that this can be up to 30% less damage taken, and uh, you can get up to three, uh, 10 Gale Force stacks. So for those like rare one-shots that might happen in hardcore, it might not happen because you have like some Gale Force. A lot of times you'll have 5 to 6, and with how Spectral Helix works, after you get hit, the Spectral Helix will probably hit the mob again, and you'll immediately be back up to some Gale Force stacks. Now for the Pantheons and Bandits, we have Major Pantheon, Soul of the Brian King, Freeze Immunity, Partial Stun Immunity, Stun and block recovery and reduced chill effect. Minor Pantheon will want Soul of Garu Khan. And this gives us shock reduced effect and helps us get shock immunity if we just get a craft on the ring or gloves. And lastly, we want to kill all bandits for two passive points and that is help Iramir because two passive points is just the best. Now we're going to go over the skill tree and the skill tree is actually pretty compact and pretty good. 
So as you can see here, this is a skill tree. You start off in Deadeye, you take a bunch of mastery. So let's go over a skill tree real fast. Now this pop is from Jung. I didn't really change it up that much at all. So this is a more beginner budget pop that he made for day one to two. Now you can see here, you just go out the projectile route and then you can opt to go down here from Lovely. Or you can go up this way. I think I recommend you go up here for Lovely just to get the claw notes because the claw notes are very important and very good in damage. And then this thing abuses the aura reservation mastery for 15% reservation efficiency of skills. You want the grace reservation efficiency mastery to, so you can run grace to term defines banner and a herald. Now here you can actually run 15% all res for leveling and it's pretty good. The claw mastery you can choose to get 20% chance to blind enemies on critical strike. If you use a Gemini's claw, if you don't use a Gemini's claw, you need to take this node in order to maintain your mana pool. So up here, another thing you could possibly do is you could take CB immunity if you don't have a CB immunity jewel. For influence right here, now we take this reservation mastery because this gives us 15% increased effect of auras, which does scale your grace and determination. For claw mastery, you have skills supported by Nightblade at 40% increased effect of elusive, which also scales your multi. And here you also have a dagger mastery, even though we don't use daggers, that gives us Elusive also grants plus 40% to crit strike multiplier for skills supported by Nightblade. And this is the life mastery, 10% life. Now this precision mastery, you don't really need. And you can switch it out for precision reservation efficiency and perhaps run precision. But this is pretty much needed if you don't have enough accuracy to hit 100%. A lot of times the paw masteries and stuff is very variable based on what gear you have. So if you don't have resist, you might need to take this elemental mastery. If you have an accuracy roll on your helm or rings or jewelry, then you won't need to have this accuracy mastery. You can take something else potentially. So down here, we have a mark mastery. Now, this is not really what I would be using. This is a placeholder for the frenzy charge on hit mark mastery. So down here, 50 life. And here you have exposure. We inflict exposure of Hydra Spear. The Hydra Spear nerf does not really affect us as we are using Hydra Spear for its intended purpose, which is applying exposure. And projectile mastery, you get projectile deal 20% increased damage for each enemy pierced. Now this is pretty good, especially in simulacrums and when there's a lot of mobs. Now the spell suppression mastery is super nice because we have 100% spell suppression nearly. So this is pretty much equal to 100% crit chance, which is really efficient for one node. And this node is super nice in that you gain life flash charges back every time you suppress spell damage. So this allows us to get a lot of life flash charges throughout a boss fight since this build doesn't have any overleach mechanics to it. But basically you can see here, the tree is very compact and that's part of the main reason why Deadeye or any right side builds are so efficient because you do get, so if you do like, if you take the different mastery, you don't need to take this clever thief note anymore. If you take the claw mastery, percent attack damage leaves his life and mana. But hopefully that explains the tree, very easy tree to follow, very strong for lovely because of how compact it is. Now for the cluster jewels, you have large cluster jewel, that you could potentially use. Now for every single build in the game, a cluster jewel setup will always be more damage, right? So if you take a cluster jewel setup, it will always be more damage than not having a cluster jewel setup. Now in order to use a cluster jewel setup, you have to start dropping points from your tree. So if you drop like points like here, let's say you drop like claws of the magpie or it even drops points right here, then you'll end up with more damage. And you do have to think of that a large cluster also grants you 14% life because you can take these two nodes at the end, which actually gives you life. So it's just something to keep in mind as you upgrade your gear. So for the cluster jewels, you can also use a medium cluster jewel and everyone knows the main way to get damage is a crit cluster with pressure points and quick getaway and double damage is really strong. And what pressure points does is that your crit strikes have a 5% chance to deal double damage. And as I said, cluster jewels will always beat out points on tree for efficiency, but you may need a higher level, so like level 95 or so. Now jewels, you always want to prioritize percent maximum life or plus maximum life abyss jewels. Uh, both types of jewels are fine. You may also need a corrupted blood jewel, which you should prioritize, or you will need the corrupted blood mastery. Best mods to look for in regular jewels, which is Viridian, Cobalt, and Crimson, are percent attack speed of claws, crit multi of one-handed melee weapons, general percent attack speed, elemental resistance, and intelligence to fix resin attributes. And the best mods in an abyss jewel are... Flat elemental damage to attacks that's caused. Damage penetrates elemental resistances if you haven't killed recently. Elemental resistance and intelligence to fix resin attributes again or even strength. And 
Percent attack speed, if you've dealt a crit recently, is extremely, extremely strong. Global crit multi is also really good, and accuracy rating is also extremely, extremely strong. So now let's go over to skill links and what our cast when damage taken setup will be. So with the new patch and having the new assassin's mark, there will be a lot of socket pressure. So you kind of have to find out like what exactly you want to be running or dropping. So I just give a, this is, this is pretty general. So Spectral Helix, Trinity, Nightblade, Inspiration, added Lightning Damage, Elemental Damage with Attacks. I have seen some pops that have added Cold Damage that's higher to Inspiration if you have too much crit already. Now for Movement Skill, we want to use two Movement Skills. We want to use Whirling Blades, Faster Attacks, Life Tap, and Flame Dash to Traverse Gaps. For Auras, we want to run Vol Grace, Herald of Ice, Determination, Defiance Banner. And Buffs, we want to use the Ancestral Protector Totem as much as possible. And then we also want to use Cast when Damage taking Vol Molten Shell. And Wittering Step is used to reset Elusive and we do put Wittering Step on left click. Now for the Helmet, Focus Craft. So we have a Focus Craft on the Helmet that every time we press Focus, we cast all of the spells in our Helmet. And we have Tornado, Onslaught, and this gives us Onslaught on boss fights. And then we also have Hydra Spear and Increased Duration. So... Now for the new mark on hit support, you could just link Assassin's Mark to mark on hit. Or if you think that you don't have enough mana, this does require I think like 100 unreserved mana or something. I don't know if they'll change the mana cost. You can also link it to Life Tap on this Whirling Blades link and no longer use faster attacks. And that will make it so that Assassin's Mark is casted with your Life Pool instead of Life Tap. So that will probably cost like 300 life. But with Claw Leech, it shouldn't really matter. So if you need sockets or mana, then you can do the setup where you put Assassin's Mark into your Whirling Blades. So you just take off faster attacks and put an Assassin's Mark, Life Tap, and Mark on Hit. But in terms of how you play the game, this, this character is a lot easier than the Berserker. It's very, very simple. You want to make sure to keep up Ancestral Protector at all times. It's a more attack speed buff. You want to use Focus to cast Hydra Spear. This applies Exposure. And a tornado. Tornado is super good because as the projectiles go in there, it reflects the damage taken. It reflects the damage the tornado takes back to the enemy. And this grants us onslaught. You can also link culling in there if you do not have the culling mark mastery that some people do. You can also put a withering step on left click. This is very important as this resets elusive, which allows you to reapply a max effect of elusive when you attack again. You want to use whirling blades as your main movement skill to go across the map and flame dash to go over gaps. And you want to save Vol Molten Shell and Vol Grace for sketchy situations. So you pretty much consider Vol Grace and Vol Molten Shell as your defensive cooldowns. Now defenses, you're running Determination. You have an easy 100% spell suppression with this build. Elusive is a huge defense layer and it gives around 40% chance to avoid all damage. You do have the amazing life gain on hit recovery from Claws. Gale Force also grants you up to 30% less damage taken at max stacks. And then you also take 25% less damage if the enemy is near a marked enemy. And you, the marks are left on enemy corpses. So if there's corpses that had marks on them before, the boss might be dealing 25% less damage. So Deadeye has huge defensive layers that are kind of conditional, but are very important in saving you in the worst case scenario. So how do you fix mana issues? You want to have Claw Mastery for 1% damage leech as mana. And then you can drop Claw Mastery if you have used Gemini's Claw. You also run Life Tap on Whirling Blades so you don't run out of mana while Whirling Blading around the map. And another thing you can do is if you want to use the Blind Node instead for the Claw Mastery, you could use a Clever Thief instead. And this also gives you the Mana Leech you will need to sustain your attacks. And why Hydra Spear after nerf? The Hydra Spear is solely used to apply exposure and the nerf does not apply to this build. Spectral Helix does not have any interaction that requires hitting the Hydra Spear multiple times. And why do I deal low damage? And the answer is your Trinity is messed up. So the way Trinity works is you want to look at your skills. And then you want to go to conf, uh, Calc. You want to look at your Spectral Helix. And you want to see if there's a damage type that will be able to alternate back and forth in doing the highest damage. So right now I'm not really sure why. Oh, it's because you don't actually run Wrath on this setup anymore. The Wrath was only available to be run if you could use the Blessing Focus Amulet Craft. But they're getting rid of that. So you can see here that cold damage should be enough to alternate back and forth between lightning and cold. Although I'm not really sure about this. It seems like it's very, very close. Oh, it's because I'm not running added cold damage or it runs added lightning damage. But ideally lightning damage is the most important as it does give us the, what's it called? 
it does give us the highest shock amount. So you just have to see if your Trinity is working. Sometimes the Trinity might not be working. I think with this setup, it'd be pretty hard for Cold to be higher than Lightning. Not too sure. So it really just depends on your setup. So you have to check if your Trinity is messed up. And if it's messed up, you want to try to get more of that damage that's not. So if you have a triangle that shows up, the triangle that is not lit up is the one that you do not you have too high of damage of. So if cold is not lit up in the Trinity, that means you have too much cold damage. If lightning is not lit up, then that means you have too much lightning damage. If fire is not lit up, then you have too much fire damage. So you can change that accordingly. And usually the easiest way is to perhaps maybe switch out added cold to added lightning, or you can change up your claw so that your claw has flat cold right here instead of all that side of flat lightning, right? So anyhow, let's go on to what gearing we'll need to do in order to make this build as strong as possible. So for the shield, no need for Red Blade Banner. This is pretty much your standard Raider Lightning Strike build. So now we just use a rare shield. Now in order to get spell suppression on the shield, you want to make sure the shield is evasion energy shield base or evasion armor suppression, evasion armor base. The shield needs to be evasion based in order to roll suppression. Core modifiers you're looking for is max life, spell suppression, then you can also get LE resist, attack speed, chance to block, increase maximum resist. And if you have an open suffix, you can craft on double damage while focus, which helps the burst window. Or you can just craft on double damage, which is extremely, extremely strong. For the helmet enchant, we want to be using spectral and helix spirals through one rotation. Now this is going to be the best enchant. So this pretty much allows your spectral helix to hit most mobs at one extra time, which is a damage multiplier. Best late game base is definitely a Blizzard Crown, as this gives an enormous amount of flat cold damage. Modifiers we want include Max Life, Ellie and Chaos Resist again, Attributes to fix your issues, Percent Evasion Life Roll, Percent Evasion Armor, if your base is Evasion Armor, you want Spell Suppression, and then this mod here is pretty good, you can get this on a Warlord Helm, and this is Percent of Physical Damage for Hits Taken as Fire. And most importantly, we want to craft on trigger socket of spells when you use focus. And this allows us to cast Hydra Spear and Tornado for our burst phase. Now, best endgame option for Amulet is definitely going to be Crystallized Omniscience and Unato's Val. And this is almost unbeatable for almost every single elemental build in the game. Now, for the best anoint, you want to use Tenacity, which is nice because it gives you 5% increased life, or you want to use Divine Judgment. Tenacity is going to be better because I think it's 1% more damage on the current pop and it gives you 5% life, right? But Divine Judgment is also not too shabby. Now, the rare amulet you want to use before you have these endgame options is you want to look for something with maximum life, crit multi, percent elemental damage with attacks, flat elemental damage with attacks, and accuracy rating. So you can see here as flat LA damage, accuracy rating, multi, life, and percent elemental damage with attacks. Obviously, it's pretty hard to get an amulet with every single one of those stats. Now, chess, I do think the best endgame option is Brass Dome with the Crystallized Omniscience, but that's very far off in the future. Now, you want to use a rare chess early game without Crystallized Omniscience. And the chess mods you want is Maximum Life, Spell Suppression, Elemental Resistance. I also saw that there's a new Eldritch mod that have plus max res as an implicit now, but that's probably pretty hard to get. You can also go for Elder Chest that gives you percent life on the chest. But most importantly, you want to craft on Gravicious Mod because you want to gain percent of maximum life as extra energy shield. Now in the new patch, we won't be running Blood Rage. So the nice part about Gravicious is you can take Ghost Stance and you pretty much have an extra like 1000 HP buffer that will pretty much be fully up. So that's super, super nice. So you want to get this craft for sure. It's having the extra 1000 EHP. For, because every single time you evade, you pretty much regen your ES to full. Now Ring's best ending game option is always going to be Shaper Ring and a Mark of the Elder. You can also use a plus maximum Frenzy Charge Ring. And like I said, Mark of the Elder is almost unbeatable. The amount of flat cold you get and, flat, and then percent attack damage you get is just way too crazy. But for Rare Ring, you want to look for maximum life, percent elemental damage of attacks, flat elemental to attacks, elemental resist, chaos resist. Now ignore the Assassin's Mark on this ring. I'm just showing that you that you should be getting flat elemental damage, resist, and life on the ring, right? Pretty simple. You can also throw an Accuracy as a mod on there if you're lacking Accuracy. You can even craft it with an Essence to get Crit Multi. But there's a lot of different options on your ring. You can also get Attributes to fix up any Attribute issues you may have. Now the best Claw type for this build is the Imperial Claw. I know that Jung in his pop was using Gemini Claw. 
And Gemini Claw is an easy way to fix your mana leech, but I prefer Imperial as it's 0.1 attack speed higher. So early game, you want to craft with Essences. This is the best way if you get a T1 Lightning Damage Essence or Cold Damage or Fire Damage Essence. Ideally, you want to be Lightning Damage purely for this build. If possible, you want to get Lightning Damage as high as possible. Since we are Secrets of Suffering, so this allows us to get the highest shock possible. So Lightning Damage Essence or Cold Damage Essence, I probably wouldn't use the Fire Damage Essence actually. You can use Attack Speed and Crit Chance also as an Essence which is Zeal. You can also craft it with Harvest which is Reforced Lightning, Cold, Fire, Speed, and Crit. But I do think that Essence with T1 Lightning Damage is the best way to go about the Claw. As you can see here, the Claw that he ended up using in the paw was just T1 Lightning and then with Crit Chance roll. And then you just craft it on Attack Speed. So if open suffix, I do like this mod, craft on double damage while focused, or you can just craft on chance to deal double damage. But without Secrets of Suffering, you probably won't have an open suffix because you'll either need to have to craft on attack speed or crit chance. So if you have the open suffix and you already have attack speed and crit chance by some miracle, you can craft on double damage while focused. This mod is extremely, extremely strong for early game bossing as... Spectral Helix is kind of a pseudo melee build, so having the focus damage window is extremely important. Now, Belt, of course, everyone knows the best endgame option is going to be Headhunter and Mage Blood. Now, for the rare Belt, we will be using a Stygian, and the modifiers we want is Maximum Life, LA Res, Chaos Res, Percent Elemental Damage of Attacks, like this Belt. And for the Abyss Jewel that you'll be putting in the Stygian, you want to get some life and flat LA damage to attacks. And I do think I mentioned some of the other mods you can get on the Abyss Jewel. Um, earlier on. Now endgame boots, I do think the best endgame option is a two-tone with elevated onslaught and elevated ailment avoidance. So you can see here you can get 10% attack cast and move speed while you have onslaught with the elevated redeemer and the elevated shaper actually gives you up to 45% chance to avoid elemental ailments. And actually if you take these notes here, this puts you up to 65% chance to avoid elemental ailments. If you take these two nodes here, oh wait, they actually got rid of that, right? So you would have to like take nodes over here. This is what bring you up to 65 plus 25, which would make you do 90%. So you can actually get ailment avoidance pretty easily in the late game if you end up using elevated onslaught, elevated ailment avoidance. But like most people, you probably won't have that stuff by the time you finish playing this build. So you just want to go with the core stuff, which is max life, movement speed, and cannot be chilled is pretty nice, like I have crafted on this pair of boots. Elemental resistance, chaos res, uh, the usual stuff, right? So enchant, flat fire damage if you killed recently is pretty good. Um, I think elemental penetration if you have not killed recently is the best enchant for bossing. Now for the gloves, you can either choose to use grips gloves or tomb fist. Tomb fist is nice because you can put more abyss jewels in. And abyss jewels are actually a huge damage increase because they give us so much flat LE damage. And if you put in the right Abyss Jewel, you can also get Intimidate, which is 10% increased damage taken. But in the beginning, you can probably just use Rare Gloves because the socket pressure might be too high from Tomb Fist. And for the Rare Gloves, you want Max Life, LA Res, Chaos Res, Percent Attack Speed, Plus 1 Frenzy Charge, Culling Strike. Now this Plus 1 Frenzy and Culling is from Warlord. So you can see here, this is like an ideal pair of Warlord Gloves. You have... Life, plus one frenzy, calling, and then the Ashling craft, which is percent increased elemental damage if you dealt a crit strike recently. Another really good mod to craft on is attack and cast speed while focused, and this also helps us increase our damage window during the focus period. So lastly, we have flasks. So flask, bottle faith, of course, is very good in software trade, but very expensive at the start. Life flask, we want to use a seating divine life flask, a ceiling for bleed removal. So even if you have a CB immune jewel, you will still get bled a lot. Utility flask, you want to use a granite flask, diamond flask, jade flask, or quartz flask. And this pretty much depends on if you want to have phasing. I think quartz is the only way to really get phasing on this build. Now, suffixes for utility flask, you want to go percent attack speed, percent armor, less effective curses, and percent evasion. If you don't have chill immunity boost, you probably need to get chill immunity or reduced effect of chill on one of these flask suffixes. For prefixes, for utility flash, you always want to use flagellants, which gives you gain charges when you're hit by an enemy, which is super OP in the invitations or any boss fights where there's a lot of mobs hitting you. So let's go over what we actually think about this wonderful, wonderful build. So as you can see here, 
there's some stuff that says make it easy or easy or difficult. So if you're not playing a different skill, you're pretty much rolling the dice and you might get a difficult skill, right? But Spectral Helix is you're making your life easier as long as you can enjoy the playstyle, right? Spectral Helix is by far one of the best builds to do all of the endgame content at, at this budget level of 1 to 2x. It was actually remarkable how easy it was to do the hidden, the maven, and every single other endgame content. You can also get the wave 25 plus simulacrum really easily on day one to two gear and it's pretty consistent and you will get decent rewards and getting to wave 25 does not really take an astronomically long time right after wave 25 is a different story but before wave 25 or wave 25 plus this build is extremely extremely strong at farming simulacrums and also you can easily transition into a stronger trinity build like as i said always spectral helix has some dog shit clear it's just not very good but eventually you'll reach the point where Lightning Strike will be do more damage and you can play Lightning Strike which will end up feeling a lot better in mapping. And this will allow you to build wealth super fast as the build has zero expensive items that are mandatory. You don't even really need to do Secrets of Suffering for this build because Assassin's Mark just gives you so much crit chance. So this build does allow you to pretty much invest all the money you make into maps instead of putting it all into your character. And the more money you invest into maps, the more money you make back, right? So it has a pretty big snowball effect on helping you have a lot more currency at the start of the league. But in the end, most important thing is you have to like to play Spectral Helix. And if you don't like Spectral Helix, then you must like being strong and meta. So there's two types of people in the world. There's people who like playing Spectral Helix. And then there's people who should play Spectral Helix even if they don't like playing it because they should like being strong and meta. But obviously people like different skills, like I always say, play what you enjoy, don't play what is the strongest unless you're a super try hard like me. But overall, very solid build, I highly recommend it to anyone. This build blows the poison variant out of the water, both I think in feel and endgame scalability. So don't play the poison spectral helix version, play this version, it's much better. I do think that Jung would probably agree. Not really sure. I do think that he thinks the poison variant is just as strong. But in my opinion, for almost 90% of the people out there, most people enjoy playing a Trinity variant rather than poison variant. But thanks for watching, everyone. Be sure to like and subscribe and find more Mage Bloods, Exalts, and Mirrors than me. Oh, yeah. Make sure to do Heist and find me the replica Albrods. I do intend to play Venom Gyre. Frame stacking and I can't play it without the boots, I will be offering you one Exalted Ore. But thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye!